Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game Tactics video. In this video we're going to talk about the five most powerful unit archetypes, at least as I perceive them. Not just what they are, but what some of the standout units that make up those categories, and most importantly, how to defend against them. I think it's pretty common that we have conversations about like, this thing is really powerful, this thing is really strong, but the follow-up question in that case should always be, so what do I do about it? How do I make it less powerful? How do I counter and engage it? How do I change my lists to take advantage of the fact that people are using these things to mitigate risk, to absorb damage, to basically play a better game so that powerful stuff doesn't beat me? I'm going to have timestamps throughout this video, and I'll have a description of the category at the bottom of the video, just basically so you know what you're looking at at each individual time, because we are basically going to be just sitting in Infinity Army talking about this kind of stuff. I don't have worked examples here. In any case, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get on with the first category. So, our first category in this list of archetypes of most powerful things in Infinity is Cheap Irregulars. And here we are in Hackerslam in Infinity Army, home of some of the game's best Cheap Irregulars. Some examples that you can really fit into this category are things like Libertos, uh, but also Dalami Infantry. Uh, most classically in the Camouflage Light Shotgun Panzerfaust, and then finally things like Zalekia Narazova and Coom Riders generally. The reason why cheap Irregulars are so effective is just it's their cost effectiveness. These are very, very cheap models that can have potentially high output because Infinity is a lethal game. If a model with a light shotgun closes in on a vulnerable piece, and eliminates it but dies in the process, but the model that you used to attack only cost 8 points, then you've kind of categorically value traded. Now, not every irregular troop is going to be good, and indeed not every irregular troop is cheap, but there are many irregulars, disposable irregulars, that are just sufficiently cost-effective and possess other qualities that make them really great additions to an army, and therefore kind of in this broad category of great value stuff. Now, here we've got, just in Hak Islam, a variety of pieces which have strengths across widely different axes. What makes a Dalami effective is very different to what makes Zulekia or a Coom Rider effective, and a Libertos kind of straddles the bounds between the two. So let's talk about defensive and offensive irregulars, how they're different and why each of them is a threat. Uh, defensive irregulars are actually something that we're going to come back to over the course of this video, because they are excellent in a defensive mix. Something like a Dalami is very cheap, and it falls into the category of what I would call a designated casualty. It's a model whose job is probably, at the end of the day, to die, but it's to die in a way that kind of absorbs your opponent's offense, deflects or ablates, more importantly. Where you sustain some casualties, but they're things that your battle plan accounts for the destruction of, and a Dalami is perfect for that. A Dalami is almost always order inefficient to engage, because it's a camouflage piece. You have to move up to it, then you have to discover it, and then, assuming you discover it, uh, or it chooses to engage you in response to a discover shoot, you then have to risk the face-to-face, -face. and a Delami has a Panzerfaust and a light shotgun. And you can't just ignore a Delami because it has a Panzerfaust. Uh, the Ur uh, example of this, obviously, is Helots in Spiral Core or Varuna slash Panoceania, which you absolutely cannot risk face to -face. You cannot risk unopposed rolls from, but also sometimes you just lose a face-to-face -face roll. On the other end of the spectrum, we have things like Coom uh, Riders and Zalekia. Now, Zalekia at 12 points is a little more expensive, but she makes up for it with outstanding stats. But in this category as well, you have things like Tega Creatures, Gakis, Pretas, uh, basically any warband, the Morlock group, um, Caledonian Highlanders, anything that costs, generally speaking, up to about 7 points, but is impetuous or fast, so motorized bounty hunters, for example, in factions that don't have Coom Riders, something that can order efficiently close the gap and hit your deployment zone. Access to a template weapon is usually a pretty key element here, although something like a Gaki can kind of make up some of the difference because they have a berserk attack. The main thing you want on, or that you, that you are worried about on a piece like this, is the ability to force a trade against your forces, 
that you can't respond to. So Berserk or Template Weapons, that kind of thing, those are what make pieces like this very powerful. Now, while we have Delamis up on screen, a Delami has infiltration, it isn't as fast as a Biker, but it begins the game far enough forward that it might be able to do some of the same thing. And then we have a Libertos, which is kind of like the perfect mix between the two and why I will often have a Libertos in my list. A Libertos is a perfect defensive, ablative, designated casualty irregular piece, because not only does it have a light shotgun, dodge well, and dogged, but it also deploys a mine. It's fantastic. Uh, but also begins just far enough up the board that you can, if you need to, make an attack with it. I attack with Libertos less these days, but absolutely, you can use that for them. So we have broadly this category of pieces that are either very annoying to attack or very annoying to attack into. Stuff that is just cost effective. And although I haven't put these five categories in any particular order, there is a reason why this one is first. It's because cheap irregulars really are only the most powerful, one of the most powerful archetypes in the game because they're just efficient. It's just your opponent has taken good stuff for the cost. So how do we deal with that? Well, dealing with things like defensive irregulars, it's worth noting that if your opponent has an ablative or a defensive screen, if your opponent has made good use of designated casualties, then you really just have to take the kills that you can get. Uh, an attack that causes three or four wounds on your three or four casualties on your opponent's army, even if they are things that your opponent was comfortable dying, is probably still a good attack. But then the next most important thing to think about when you are attacking into stuff like a Delami screen, for example, is you have to be really cognizant of what I would call like the cost of doing business, the cost of attacking an army like this. If you are dealing with Varuna, if you are dealing with Hack Islam, and there are Mimitism Zero camouflage markers in and about the deployment zone and the, um, the midfield, it is a cost of doing business that you really just do not, do not take the risk. You want to engage and destroy those pieces as a cost of attacking into the Hack Islam or the Varuna player, because the risk of... Uh, ignoring or avoiding those things can be catastrophic. Don't just move a tag through the open because a Talami has a Panzerfaust and a Helot has a light rocket launcher. It is probably going to take you a turn to clear out the Talamis, to clear out the Helots. The cost of trying to avoid or ignore them is going to be higher than the cost of just wheedling them out and deleting them. There are a couple of ways that you can do this, and you can do this both aggressively and like conservatively. The aggressive way to do it is to have pieces of your own that you can rush forward through this screen and trip the defenses. So things like your own Tiger Creatures, your own Coom Riders, those are pieces that, if they die, but they die revealing a Sunduk board, or they die re re revealing multiple Helots, then you then get to engage and destroy at your discretion those pieces that you have to just deal with as the cost of doing business. A piece like McMurra is on the expensive end for doing this, but has a good chance of surviving. Uh, stuff that is very aggressive into your opponent can force your opponent to give up the defensive layer of camouflage, which often is characterize these kind of pieces, and get them into the open so that you can engage and destroy them. The other thing to do is just to to discover them, wheedle them out, do it the hard way. If you have sensor remotes in your list, those are better for those are great for that now because they have discover plus six at long even at long range from the sensor. So you'll be rolling on you know often thirteens for example against something like a Libertos, and you can do that kind of safely. A Libertos is not necessarily going to reveal for a sensor bot, particularly if you have an ability to repair it. Then you can move up with the big guns. Failing that, just stuff with decent whip, make the rolls, push through. Accept that you might lose a turn of forward momentum to dealing with the pieces that will bear trap you if you just push in too hard, uh, if you don't have pieces that can can spring those traps, but you have to, right? You just have to accept that if you're dealing with cheap defensive irregulars, you have to deal with them. If you can't circumvent them, if you can't go around them, if you can't ignore them, your opponent has deployed them correctly, they are part of your opponent's defensive mix, you have to overcome that as the first barrier, and accordingly position your army in the fact that you're not going to fully defang your opponent turn one, they're going to have a chance to crack at you, the game will go on for multiple turns. And by the way, if I'm describing what sounds like kind of a good game of Infinity, yeah, there is a reason why I like these pieces. I like the fact that there are things in a game that can extend the game out to turn two for both players, to turn three for both players. I'm a big fan of Dalami and Libertos and Helots, etc. Uh, but if you're attacking into them, you need to know what to do. 
The next question here is, okay, well, what about the aggressive ones? What about the pieces that are going to slam into me? Things like Tager creatures. Uh, ultimately, Tager creatures have been significantly moderately nerfed uh, of late in terms of recent patches. But you still have, there are plenty of things in the game that can make a run at your deployment zone at low cost and be really annoying. Usually you will expect them to have a template weapon, some melee ability, and they'll be fast. So things like Morlocks, for example, I'm not necessarily as scared of because Morlocks are often, not always, often just speed 4-4. It will take a long time for them to cross the table. Something like an Uberfell Commando on the first turn is not what I would consider to be an Ur attacker because as good as the Uberfell Commando is, she's expensive, but also at 6-4 from the deployment zone starting position, she's kind of just slow enough that getting her all the way to your deployment zone and killing some of your stuff is actually not necessarily going to be an efficient attack that often. Uh, it's things that are fast enough to very quickly close the gap and very quickly and efficiently attack that are the most challenging. So it's stuff with 8-6 movement, it's stuff with 6-6 movement and impetuous. Those are the biggest threats. If your opponent is coming at you with Uberfall Commando, a lot of the same advice will apply, but I don't consider them to fall into this, this archetype of, you know, one of the five best archetypes in the game. So, how do we deal with cheap irregular attackers? There are a few th there are a few things. One of the first things to note is you don't want to these kind of pieces are usually efficient solutions to your own midfield. So I just mentioned for example how good defensively Libertos and Delami etc are as defensive pieces but you can force them out and force them to reveal by face checking them with stuff like Coom Riders and Tagers. Yeah, don't rely on your midfield as the necessary solution to cheap irregular attackers. Cheap irregular attackers are good at overcoming cheap irregular defenders. A cheap irregular defender might be all you have, but it isn't the ideal solution. What you really want here is for your defensive mix to include long and medium range AROs. Your combi rifles, your flash pulses, your tags on overwatch, even your humble total reaction bot. Deploying and utilizing these pieces is always going to be one of the most challenging parts of Infinity because your opponent is going to probably have their own big guns and big guns in active turn will beat big guns in reactive turn. But if you are going second, you are presumably deploying second. You have not made the terrible mistake of going second, deploying first. Don't do that. Uh, and so you will have some idea of where your opponent's big guns are going to be. And you will at least know usually if there is lots of SWC in reserve, so you can know if there's going to be a big SWC gun in reserve. You want to engineer situations where your big guns and medium range guns are watching positions that cannot be easily moved into and shot from by your opponent's big guns. You want to cordon off, usually it's going to be something like, think about like the halfway line, to your deployment zone. You want that space to be covered to the extent possible by pieces like your combis, just watching sort of like close angles, um, your, your HMGs, your marksman rifles, whatever stuff, looking into your half of the table because that is a space that your opponent's models with template weapons will have to move through before they can penetrate your DZ. You've got, you know, a 12 to 16 inch gap that you can kind of use there, right, from the halfway, like slightly beyond the halfway line to slightly inside your deployment zone. That's the space that you want to make as, as difficult as possible for cheap irregulars to move through. The next thing you want to think about is kind of accepting the trade. And against different irregulars, this is going to work differently. Uh, a Tega creature, for example, is very easy to accept the trade against. A Coom Rider is more challenging because it has Dogged. A uh, Libertos is more challenging because it has Dogged. Like Tega creatures are kind of like okay at this. They're more like all rounders and they're they're you know they're fast. They're okay, really. A Tega creature, a Tega creature's only advantage over a Coom Rider is its silhouette. In all other respects, the, the Coom Rider is like significantly superior. Uh, and Berserk, actually, I guess. Tega creatures have Berserk. Um, in any case, the point here is to recognize that your opponent if they're sufficiently dedicated and sufficiently good and they're willing to take the hit, is that you are also probably going to take the hit. This is where we talk about those things like designated losses. Something is going to have to go down. It's very, very rare that you will get through your opponent's first offensive turn without losing pieces. Controlling what those pieces are going to be and making sure that they aren't integral to your game plan is really good. And we'll get to, a bit further down the line, why some of the most powerful pieces in the, games, in the game are things that can circumvent those decisions on your part.
but against cheap irregular attackers they will usually have to engage the first thing that you are defending with and so you want the first thing you are defending with to be something that is not critical and which can die and take the trade. Ultimately, if a Tega creature trades for a Delami, or trades for a Ghulam Infantry, or trades for, you know, an Ikadron in Combined Army, then the Tega creature has traded up, but they haven't traded up hugely. They've traded six or seven points for, you know, eight or nine. That's, or even, you know, ten or eleven. That's not ideal, but your opponent had to spend orders to make that kill. They had to Impetuous the Tega, and then move the Tega, and then probably move the Tega again, and then Berserk the Tega, for example. If it took them an impetuous and three orders, which is a pretty good attack run, to be honest, if they, that took them that many orders out of their first turn to kill something of equivalent value of yours, you're basically fine. You've come out ahead of that. Their attack has not been hugely efficient. You have controlled the damage in that one particular case. Things will get more challenging if they're able to hammer the breach, exploit the opening, etc. But accepting those designated losses. And then if you can, the more advanced tactic is to have a plan for reconstituting your force. This is something I've seen happen recently locally in a lot of games, not just ones that I've played. And it is surprisingly efficient against irregular attacks because the nature of irregular attacks are that they are trades. A Libertos that runs into a total reaction bot, puts two templates into it, gets shot, dies, but knocks the total reaction bot unconscious is a good trade. But if the total reaction bot gets sorted up by an engineer in the next order of their opponent's first turn, it isn't as good a trade anymore. What it's accomplished might have been bought your turn of breathing room, but if total reaction bot is back, but the Libertos is dead, and force reconstitution has been really effective. Purely anecdotally, uh, an opponent that I played today was describing a game that they had had uh, a couple of days ago against a Hassassin player, where they had they had gone in and they had made a mess, and Brandon Castro had shotgunned a whole bunch of things into unconsciousness, and the Hackerslam player had taken their licks, they'd knocked Brandon Castro out, and then they'd spent three or four orders with an Asawira doctor just picking all of the pieces back up. Now that consumed a lot of the Hackerslam player first turn, but the board state was then reset, the Hackerslam force had been reconstituted, and moving into turn two, things were kind of on an even footing, except the Nomad player was now down Brander Castro and couldn't repeat the attack. And that can happen a lot with cheap irregulars, where they come into you, they, they, they make that hammer blow, you're reeling, but you kill them as part of the trade, and if you can bring back the pieces that they destroyed, and just even keel your way into turn two, that can be extremely effective because the player using those irregular pieces can't repeat the tactic unless they have lots of irregular pieces and you can only have 15 troopers in infinity. Ultimately, when discussing cheap irregulars, you are going to have, you have to deal with the fact that they are efficient pieces. If your opponent is using cheap irregulars, they are using an efficient, well-costed army, the cost of which is that you have to manage the fact that not all of your troops generate regular orders. You should probably also be using an efficient army, whether your army is efficient because it includes link teams, whether it's efficient because it's just got good pieces across a broad spectrum. There are lots of ways to make an efficient and effective army. Cheap irregulars are one of them, and you should also make sure that your army, however, however it's constituted, should also be efficient and effective. If you can do that, you'll have your own strengths to leverage. Cheap irregulars are just one of them. But... Cheap Irregulars leads us on into the next category. Main Battle Warbands. Now, this is not actually going to be a totally accurate description and is kind of me being a little tongue-in-cheek. I like referring to them this way. What we are actually talking about here is kind of two archetypes. Uh, and by the way, the reason I call them this is if you think about like a main battle tank or a main battle tag, some factions have pieces that function like warbands, but which are super heavy. They are super heavy equivalents of the warband. And here we are in Infinity Army in Ariadna, home of the Polaris Bear Pode. Now, I actually think there are kind of two pieces, two different types in this archetype. One of them is primarily unique to Ariadna. And it's bear podes. Bear podes and other, realistically, it's bear podes and other equivalent kind of pieces. Uh, we really should not forget about things like McMurray in this kind of context. It's that big, heavy, can comfortably wade through like one or two AROs uh, and otherwise function in the same way as a frustrating and annoying and dangerous trading piece. So the Ur example is often going to be this 31-point bear pod, but you can absolutely include stuff like Devil Dog teams, 
uh, Dog Warriors and Cameronians, McMurrah in factions that have access to him, that kind of like, just in this kind of dangerous, tough, can take multiple hits, push through your lines, and not just trade with one piece, but trade with multiple pieces. On the other side of this category, you have, and like really quite neatly bifurcated, pieces that attack in a very similar way, but are faster and often hackable. And that's where we get things like the Sujan and Roadbots. Now, they stretch the description of like main battle warbands. Those things are more like main battle remotes. Uh, but they possess many of the same qualities. If you think about like a Polaris Bearpode as an incredibly souped up Demorlock group or, you know, Caledonian, Highland Caledonian Highlander, then Roadbots and Sujans are incredibly souped up Coom Riders. In either case, you have a piece that takes an existing strength of an efficient cheap piece and makes it into an efficient expensive piece. So almost always they are compromised of very tough to kill or at least tough enough that they will punch through an initial defense and because they can punch through an initial defense it means that managing your casualties is harder. It's much more difficult to have designated losses against a main battle warband because they're going to hit your lines and usually punch through the initial defenses unless you've gotten sort of like relatively lucky or layered your AROs really really well. On top of that, some of them will have guns, worthwhile guns. A Polaris Bearpoid is okay with its shotgun, but when you get into the realms of things like Sujans, they'll have Panzerfaust in addition to their shotguns, and of course the Roadbot has a marksman rifle. It isn't an incredible marksman rifle, but you can't necessarily defend against it the same way. You can't just have random AROs, it can contest things like flash pulses. So really it is the fact these things are made more challenging by the fact that they can deliver a more dedicated attack and that casualty management against, against them is more difficult. It's difficult to manage your casualties. So how do we defend? Well, one of the first things to think about is you take the same principles that you would apply to a cheap irregular attack and you, you scale up in the same way that the attack scales up. Main battle warbands are particularly things like bear pods. They are going to be slower than things like coom riders. It does take them longer to get to your deployment zone. I mentioned that, for example, an Uberfell Commando is not going to blitz across the battlefield at the same speed as a Tega Creature or a Coom Rider, and a Bear Pode is no exception. The orders that it will take them to get to your deployment zone are its a higher, higher investment for them to make the attack. As a result, you can kind of accommodate more casualties because it's costing your opponent more to attack. You pretty much, against Bear Podes, have to just take your licks and it really is a case where the old the old adage stays very true. Always be shooting. If you can put a hit into a bear pod, put a hit into a bear pod. Don't try and dodge, particularly the shotgun bear pod. It's got a BS-11 shotgun. It's just going to shoot you or get into close combat. You have to put your licks onto them. Ex just punch, punch through to the extent that you can. Put them into dogged at least. Once they are dogged, you can start thinking about pure casualty, like just casualty avoidance a little bit more. So if a bear pode comes into you and you, you know, you hit it a couple of times with a combi, um, maybe you get it with a chain rifle and you do like three, honestly, three damage, 13 hits into a bear pode has a good chance of putting it dogged. That is not that much when you think about it, but it is still enough for it to punch through like a mine and a chain rifle and into your lines. When it reaches that point, your, your goal is basically going to be just keep shooting it, whatever the arrow has to be. Like it, it almost doesn't matter how powerful, how, how important to your, um, your battle plan, the thing that it's gotten into is. You have to keep shooting a bear pod until it goes dogged, and then you can start thinking about casualty mitigation by dodging, dodging to engage, whatever. Same rules apply against something like McMurrah, against something like a Caledonian, um, any of those kind of pieces except that they don't have dogged, so you just shoot them until they're dead. In that respect, it's very, very much like taking your trades against the cheap irregular pieces. It's just that you're going to sustain more casualties because you're being attacked by a slightly slower, more expensive piece. It is going to suck, but you have to maintain kind of that like positive, positive and, and um, objective mindset. Think about what your opponent is expending and what they are, what they are using to attack you and be aware that your casualties are going to be commensurate. 
As with irregular troops, cheap irregular, cheap irregular attackers, reconstituting force is really, really useful here. And because we are dealing, as again, with cheap irregular attackers, because we're dealing with things that are impetuous, having some long and medium range AROs, in particular stuff that maybe disincentivizes, you consider at this point, you consider adjusting your ARO range bands. If you have a total reaction bot, you can be more aggressive with its positioning because part of what you want to do is you want to disincentivize impetuous movements. If a total reaction bot is deployed in a position where maybe your opponent can make like move, move, move again with their tag and engage it, Ariadne obviously having tags now, and take a couple of orders and put your total reaction bot down and you've scored no kills with it, but it's taken them a couple of orders, maybe say three orders to engage and destroy, I've obviously had games where it's taken like seven because total reaction bots can be very challenging to put down. But in the process, you also caused a bear pode to not impetuous. Then that is just doing that little bit extra to defang the attack, control in reactive and in deployment how the offensive turn is going to play out. So that can be very worthwhile. The other thing to think about is the general effectiveness of comms attacks and hacking. Now, obviously, bear pods are total immune. Really, all you can do is target them. But if you can target a bear pod on the way in, it significantly increases your ability to put it down with your subsequent, just whatever you can throw at it, attacks. If you have a combi rifle firing into a bear with a line infantry, and you're like, well, crap, I have to do this, uh, you're going from hitting on, in many cases, 14s to 17s. You have a much smaller window of failure. Targeting bear pods is still really, really good. The firepower that gets put into them as they hit your lines is materially multiplied by that. When we talk about things like Sujan and Roadbots, hacking becomes much, much more imp important. Oh, quick segue, obviously, not every faction has jammers, but if you do have jammers, they're great against bear pods. It is something that you have to think about at list construction. You can't just be like, oh, I'll have jammers for this game. Uh, only so many factions have them, but if you have jammers or a razor ferroware, it can really, really help. It will create a zone that the bear pod really doesn't want to necessarily risk moving into, and you know, consider that if you are having specific trouble with them. Not every faction has that, though. If you do have access to hacking as a defensive ARO, and every faction except for basically Toha should, and even and Ariadna, should have access to some kind of hacking defenses, hacking defenses are very good against things like Roadbots and Sujans. These pieces are super fast and very dangerous and often can be more resilient or as resilient as something like a bear pod. A Sujan is almost the high watermark of stuff that will smash into your lines with a shotgun on the first turn. But they are very hacking susceptible. Both of them are hackable, they can be isolated, they can be carbonated, obviously they can be spotlit. And a, a hacking area defense is something that those pieces must respect. Any faction, just about in the entire game, can have some repeaters in their deployment zone and some hackers. It usually is not an impost. Like, you don't have to be nomads to have one or two flash pulse remotes, a forward observer remote, and a hacker. That is a perfectly reasonable part of just about any force mix. And that alone, one WIP-13 hacker with sufficient repeater coverage is enough that a Sujan is like, doesn't necessarily want to risk the 65% the chance to get hit by an Oblivion. Ideally, two hackers is better than one. Obviously, burst two is better than burst one. But you can, you can with relatively light investment of force, present something that at least makes deployment zone penetration less likely. You don't need to have Morans to defend against something like a Sujan. The, the important place for a hacking area, I cannot emphasize this enough, if you have to choose, the critical place for a hacking area is on the terminal approach to your deployment zone. You want repeaters in positions where the movement from outside your deployment zone to into or at the edge of your deployment zone crosses a repeater threshold. And with 8-inch zone of control on your repeaters, that is usually very doable with just your DZ. Because that is that is the most important part of the table to defend, because it is, it is the terminal approach. It is okay if a Sujan comes all the way across the table, as long as when it gets to just before it would attack you, it is stopped there. And Obviously, you can't guarantee that your hacking attacks will be successful, but a savvy Sujan or Roadbot player will think about the investment they would have to make to cross that gap. Even for something as fast as a Roadbot, it is non-trivial to get all the way from one deployment zone to another, and the risk of spending those orders and then being stopped cold is very, very high. So a hacking defense is incredibly valuable. Now, 
if you're playing Ariadna and you don't have that, that's fine. You have bear pods. Just put bear pods on defense. You'll be okay. Whatever. Throw some smoke grenades. Shoot back. Dodge into melee. I don't care. Bear pods are big and chunky, and you can use them to defend against things like Suchans. Uh, if you're playing with Toha, then you have Ferroware. Now, Ferroware is useless against models with structure. Yes, but you have Taquil officers who can mirrorball in ARO, and if you project that mirrorball zone of control, then as the Sujan makes its terminal approach, you can start like ink farting out huge eclipse zones, which a Sujan can't see through. And if it's if it's the Sujan with a Spitfire light flamethrower, it can intuitive attack, which is something to bear in, bear in mind. But the most common Sujan profile is the 0SWC plus one burst heavy shotgun, and that one can't intuitive attack. So you just use your Ferroware to, you can use your Symbio bombs for this if you need to. Just blanket your deployment zone in ink so that the attack reaches your deployment zone, and then has nothing to do. Most factions have something that they can do kind of in this vein. Obviously, the exception is Ariadna, but even Ariadna, if you absolutely need to, yeah, you've just got things that throw smoke. Things that throw smoke um, or dodge to engage. Ariadna has very high fizz and CC across the board that can do things like yeet into melee with a roadbot. So, in general, factions have some kind of an option here. Okay, we're going to change gears now, but stay thematically on point um, and move into our next category. So, we've gone from main battle warbands to main battle tags. Things that are big, heavy, fast, dangerous, and here we are in Pan Oceania, kind of home of the main battle tag. But just about every faction, with very few exceptions, have something that fits into this role. A hugely armoured, hugely dangerous fire platform that brings its own orders and is basically difficult to solve. There are a huge variety of tags in the game, and really we shouldn't neglect thinking about the lighter tags in this fight, like a Sphinx. A Sphinx is really no less terrifying in many respects than a Yotam. It just attacks in a very, very different way. Um, ultimately, we are dealing with the category here of very dangerous, very difficult to kill, gear check kind of pieces. And part of the challenge of tags is that they are, in some respects, something of a gear check. More than any other piece in this list, tags are something that you kind of want to think about at list creation. Not every list for every scenario necessarily has to have a, an answer or a response to tags, but you want to at least have had the thought, what do I do if there is an armor 8 three structure piece standing on the highest part of the table. How will my specialist move forward? How will my cheap irregular pieces attack if a large portion of the table is under overwatch by a ballistic skill 14 or 15 explosive round firing gun platform? And often for many armies this is going to be a mechanical solution. A tag is a very big, very dangerous piece but it can be efficiently countered by a sufficiently big, sufficiently dangerous gun. That can mean that your response to a tag is to have your own tag and to pilot it better, or for your tag to be better than your opponent's tag, or specific kind of anti-tag weapons. Uh, stuff like a Gamma Fuerback in O12, or an Azrael, like very cost efficient. An Azrael is barely more than, than 40 points, but it has uh, ballist Ballistic Skill 13, Burst 4, Damage 16, Armor Piercing, Continuous Damage, Heavy Machine Gun. A tag must respect and fear an Azrael, and your opponent will be forced to play it accordingly. You do not necessarily need to have the plan to be to kill the enemy tag, but you have to think about how you're going to constrain it. Because if your opponent can just be like, oh, the tag I have can't be hurt because my opponent has combi rifles, therefore I can massively improve my defensive game by using it as an ARO piece. That's the situation that you want to avoid. And then similarly, the situation you want to avoid is the tag rampaging into your lines. Now, everything I said in the previous section about having a passable hacking net or using Ferroware as Toha to defend against Sujans applies identically to defending against tags. Uh, just use your hacking network. Your hacking network is your defensive tool. And if you must, you, you null deploy and hide behind a hacking network. If your opponent has a good force mix, then you will really need to play a good defensive game, because what if, right? What if your opponent has 
cheap irregular attackers like Takers and a main battle tag like a Raicho or an Avatar. That's why those pieces are good, because some of the some of the things that you would use to counter a Taker creature will in turn be efficiently engaged by an Avatar. This is what we call a force mix, and this is why you respond with a good force mix of your own. But at list construction, at list construction you need to think about how at bare minimum am I going to mitigate what my opponent will do if they just put a tag on Overwatch. Uh, I at least need to have smoke or I need to have some kind of hacking defense and solution, maybe the ability to offensively project a network, or ideally some kind of a gun that a tag must respect. A base heavy machine gun can be used in an absolute pinch if it's sufficiently high quality, but really what you want are good armor piercing rounds on a platform that can survive an explosive round back if you lose a face-to-face -face roll. Most factions have something that's like this, even if it is your own tag, and if it is your own tag, that is totally fine, but there are plenty of other things. There are also some serious anti-tag experts available to many factions. Shinobu Kitsune, Shinobu Kitsune and Oniwaban exist. Uh, Speculo Killers exist, and those are extremely cost-efficient responses to a tag, because it will usually take them a couple of orders to enter into close combat, and then one order to kill the tag, and you may lose it to a tag simply flamethrower, but you've lost 30 to 40 points, and your opponent has lost up to 100 or more. The other thing to consider is, in addition to just building the tools into your list, making sure that you have something in a list that a tag respects and fears, even if it's literally just good smoke and a good mimetism minus six breaker combi, like that could do it, Uberfell Commando will do it, like it doesn't have to be a gun, but it has to be something, it has to be something that threatens a tag, on deployment, you have to think and just you have to do a check and think, does my counter still apply? Because not every tag will be responded to efficiently the same way. If my opponent has a cutter, then my Azrael is not going to cut it anymore because my Azrael is going to be hitting on sevens while the cutter is hitting on fifteens. And I'm not prepared to take that face to face roll. It's much more likely that I go down before the cutter does. Only in desperation would I take that fight. Uh, but the cutter doesn't have a heavy flamethrower. It doesn't really have any close range defense. So it doesn't have an MSV. So my tools for it will change. Uh, a Marut for me is often one of the most fearsome tags because it has an MSV. I can't just bypass it. I have to take the fight. But fortunately, something like an Azrael or a Gamma Fwareback or my own tag can fight the Marut on mostly even terms. The standout example here of where your mechanical solutions might fail you is the Avatar. The Avatar can't be possessed, Mimitism minus six, high armor, high whip. It is just very, very difficult to engage an Avatar with dedicated Avatar solution, but some factions do have it. Generally speaking, the very best stuff to deal with an Avatar is something like a linked multi-sniper with an MSV shooting through smoke. Now, a surprising number of factions do actually have that. Uh, it exists in Starmada, it exists in Morad Aggression Force, it exists in a few different Pan-Oceanian forces. Uh, worst case scenario, just Akahu. Um, obviously, Pan-Oceanian forces don't have smoke, but MSV, Mimetism visors. Uh, MSV, Mimetism, good guns in Pan-Oceania. You can take that fight with Akahu, you can take that fight with a Kamau, you can take that fight with a Bear Pode. Um, you have a variety of solutions, but the Avatar is the one that is most likely to deflect your conventional easy include. However, it is also the most expensive piece in the entire game, which means the rest of your opponent's list, particularly with both the Avatar points increase and the change to net rods costing and the change to Tager creatures, like Combined Army Staples costing more points, means that an Avatar is not a trivial deployment. And you can to an extent, just elect to play around tags. Some scenarios it will be challenging if it's something like Supremacy and the Avatar is just trumpling around collecting zones, that's gonna be a problem. But in some cases, the scenario will allow you to just be like, you know what, the Avatar has taken the high ground, my opponent wanted it more, I am going to have to spend more orders taking cautious movements, I am going to have to just avoid it, deflect it, deal with it, tie it up if I can, and accept that even if I never kill it, I am, spending some points every turn just to keep it mitigated and keep it in check. If you have things that can avoid a Sepsator, those are ideal. Literally any cubeless model can make a run on, in, run on in close range and get into close combat. In addition, the fact that the Avatar lost remote presence 
is actually quite relevant because incidental wounds on it are now scarier. There is a chance your opponent will still try to repair it, but as Avatar players play without remote presence more and more, they are going to learn the absolute pain and rage that is spending three of your own orders to put your own lieutenant unconscious. Uh, if I am playing an Avatar, I might take an Engineer, but I'm probably not, because the only things on the Avatar that I would Engineer, uh, I'm not going to Engineer it, I might Engineer it if it's unconscious, but probably not, because I'm probably using Mnemonica in that case. So I'm mostly going to and trying to Engineer away states that are inflicted on it. And frankly, it can reset out of most of those. If it gets isolated, it's gotten isolated, I'm going to chuck it in a high place, watching things, and get on with my life using my veterans. I play Avatars very, very little though. Uh, but... Yeah, the avatars now incidental damage will add up against them more, and the same is true for other factions that don't have remote presence tags. So a cutter, uh, provided the Panoceanian player has command tokens to reroll their inevitable failures at whip 12, a cutter can be repaired kind of ad nauseum. An avatar can't, and other main battle tags can't. So do be aware of the fact that as incidental damage accrues on tags, your windows for destruction of those tags increase. While we're talking about tags, we should also talk about the difference between hard and soft kills. Tags are a piece, probably more than any other piece, that is susceptible to a soft kill. So, where it's not dead, but it's put in a position, usually as a result of hacking, where it has become much, much less effective. Uh, the very, very classic example is if your opponent, if you manage to kill a Panoceanian Engineer, and you isolate and immobilize a cutter, the cutter is out of the game. Uh, it cannot reset clear of those states, and it can't do anything else. It is completely bricked. Hacked is not dead, but it can be very, very close. The utility of a soft kill is going to be one of the things that varies most from game to game, because if the cutter has gotten into a zone, or we are playing for army points destroyed, and you brick the cutter, but it is still alive, it's alive in a zone, or it's alive with army points still on the table which means that you need to think before assuming that hacking is your solution to tags. Possession is also something to be very judicious about. When a tag is possessed, its speed and all of its other stats get significantly reduced, which makes it less good at being used to shoot your opponent, but possession is still a very valuable tool. The big downside of possession, and there is a downside, is that it is very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult for you to put hits into a model you have possessed. You cannot declare ballistic skill attacks against it directly. I have killed possessed battle tags in the past by running them into base contact with enemies and then shooting those enemies at terrible range with things like K1 weapons so that every shot hits my possessed tag. But those are rare cases. Most of the time, if you possess a tag, you have rendered it invulnerable for a turn. In that case, what you want to think about is positioning the tag in a way where when it gets repossessed, and it usually will, it is in a very challenging position to effectively utilize. The most classic example here is what I would call the cordyceps, which is where you possess the tag and then climb it up to a high place and leave it there, in the same way that the cordyceps fungi take over ants and just climb them up high. Uh, just stick it up somewhere high. With the new climbing rules, it is more difficult to get up than it is to get down. So possess a tag that is next to a wall and make one climb movement. Uh, it will take the tag two orders to get back down. And if your repeater is still there, it's getting hacked the entire way. The other thing you can do is move the tag into a position where it is in combat with one of your units. Now, you have to do this carefully because your opponent will be able to just, if your opponent has combi rifles, they'll fire into that melee uh, in reasonable confidence that the tag you're sh they're shooting into the melee with is not necessarily going to die. It's probably going to be okay. But if you can, particularly if you can arrange a situation where the tag is in close combat, when it gets, like, you move it into base contact with your unit, and then when your opponent dispossesses the tag, it's immediately in close combat, and your close combat model is not vulnerable. So a classic example that I did early in N4 was I moved the tag to fully block a doorway. I possessed a Yotam, I moved the Yotam up to the doorway, and then I moved Liang Kai up to the other side of the doorway. So Liang Kai was touching the Yotam, and the Yotam was fully blocking any line of sight to Liang Kai, and when the, blotum, the Yotam got depossessed, it was now in close combat with my best close combat model. And that was it. It, it, it fought him several times and died. Uh, I've also had games, if you look at my um, Hassassin reports from, I think it was Wintercon last year, 
I had one game where I was able to, I, I tried to Emirat a, a Dragao, and the damn thing passed both of its saves, so I had to possess it and then run, run McMurray into close combat, but the important thing was that McMurray ended up prone behind like a bridge kind of construct, so that there was no easy way for my opponent to just shoot into the combat until McMurray died. McMurray was trapping the Yotam. If you're going to possess the tag, and move it someplace, you want to really make sure it ends up in a situation where it doesn't just get dispossessed and then move on with life. If you have no other choice, then at least moving it out of cover and watching it with a bunch of guns is an option, but I would really, I would oblivion it and like get on with your life before I did that. In any case, soft, soft versus hard kills. A hard kill, threatening a hard kill is often preferable, but if you don't have a hard kill, you can fall back on evaluating whether or not the scenario and the situation on the table makes a soft kill worthwhile. And if you evaluate a soft kill as worthwhile, pursuing that. And while we're talking about soft kills, let's move on to the next category. Hacking and missile alpha strikes. Our fourth and final category is basically Anything that starts with your opponent landing a repeater of some description in or near your deployment zone. I've done an entire video on defending against missile alpha strikes, and to a pretty broad extent, everything that I speak about in terms of defending against missile alpha strikes also applies to defending against hacking alpha strikes, but I want to break down the difference. Both of them start with functionally the same offensive maneuver, which is to project a hacking network into your opponent's deployment zone. So usually this will be some kind of, not necessarily quick, but pitches, um, with Robin Hook emerging in Nomads. She's also not a bad way to do this. And then Fast Pandas. So Nomads are a very common faction that can do this, but many combined army factions can as well. And in a pinch, you can do it with some other factions. Like O12 can potentially make this play. Hack Islam certainly can at a relatively low cost, because Hassas in Bereeds are two troopers you take that give you both the pitchers and the hackers. So the start of the run is always going to be the same. It is your opponent doing something where they move forward, usually the ability to place pitchers, and they bracket your deployment zone with pitchers, and then they commence offensive action. Now, what the offensive action is changes depending on the attack. Uh, a missile alpha strike is obviously a missile alpha strike, where step one is to spotlight, step two is to land missiles. But for my money, the more dangerous and more effective play, if you have the option, is to not try and spotlight opponent troops. It's to try and trinity and kill opponent hackers. Uh, because something like an anathematic is an incredibly dangerous hacker. And if it has a firewall advantage, it is going to blow through, particularly on the first turn before fairy dust can be put up on something like an Asura. It is going to usually blow through literally any hacker in the game. Now, it's a lot of orders to kill maybe two models, right? Two or three. I've, I think the most I've accomplished is I've killed three hackers on the first turn uh, before. But the reason why this is so effective as a tactic is not actually the damage necessarily that it does. Three, three kills on the first turn is kind of tolerable, but three kills of those specific models is a little catastrophic, particularly in combination with the pitcher placements, because what this kind of attack is doing is that it is, it's only extending materiel, it isn't extending troopers, like Bit and Kiss can often pull back to safety, and the Anathematic is back in the combined army player's deployment zone, slowly moving forward. So what it is doing is it's only risking materiel, and it is setting incredibly strongly the conditions for an eventual victory. The, the consequence of this attack don't necessarily materialize on the first turn, they materialize on the reactive player's first active turn, and second turn, and third turn. Because they establish, firstly they establish total hacking dominance, because you just killed all of your opponent's hackers, and secondly, you've bracketed your opponent's deployment zone with repeaters. So now, all of the stuff that they want to do has to at least begin with clearing the repeaters off. That's why this is so powerful, is that it is, it is a... Dangerous, but ultimately conservative offense that sets incredible defensive preconditions. And it sucks. It's really good. It is one of the best things to do in the game. There are only a small number of factions that can do it really efficiently, but there are a few factions that can do it kind of just generally. I'm going to direct you to my video on guided missiles for all of the general principles with deal for dealing with this. And add the caveat that 
you want to know it if you can you want to know that it's coming you want to kind of recognize that this is a potential tactic and think about what the pieces you have that you need to defend are. Do you need to defend your hackers? Do you need to defend your lieutenant from a missile strike or some other key piece? Because you can only defensively prioritize so much, you need to know what your opponent will attack. So there's a degree of meta knowledge there. Otherwise, the things I mentioned about in the irregular section about reconstituting force can be very relevant here. Trinity often leaves bodies, not corpses. So if you can reconstitute your troops, that can be very relevant and very useful. And as I mentioned in the guided missile group, doing things, guided missile video, doing things like bracketing, keeping your opponent from easily projecting those, those repeater networks is one of the most important things that you can do. Otherwise, you can mechanically build to deal with this at list construction. If you see to be people talking about, for example, how they highly value camouflage hackers, that's because camouflage hackers can just not reveal and not have to deal with this on the first turn. If all of your hacking presence is under a camouflage marker, you are prima facie immune to this. Now, for my money, I think there are too many, there are far too many good value hackers to play in the game that can't be placed under a under a, um, a camouflage marker. Uh, you know, you've got a 12 point Kappa hacker in O12. It's only 12 points, it's fantastic, take that. You've got, you know, things like Passasin Barids who are the most efficient for cost hackers in the game. You've got Jazz who is, you know, up there as well. You have all of these, these lean hacking profiles that, yeah, you don't want to just not take because an anathematic might kill them. That's fearing the boogeyman too much, but if you are building a list that wants to make heavy use of hacking, you really want to think about what are the hacking pieces that you're going to use. And maybe if this is a threat, you know, if this in your local environment is a threat, consider steering away from really luxury pieces. Consider steering away from, like I, for example, really like Merry Problems. I think she's a super cool piece, but I would probably not take Merry Problems if there was an anathematic bit and kiss on the prowl, because she is prime. She's absolutely prime prey for this kind of thing. I also would consider against putting hackers in link teams. Uh, yes, tinbots are nice and can help defend here, but if you are running like a light infantry core and you slap a hacker in the core to give it six cents, what you are doing is you are allowing the combined army player in this case to comfortably, like easily take away your link bonuses by killing your hackers so that, and then they can engage whatever your like, you know, usually a sniper is. So be careful about that at list construction. Otherwise, uh, I will direct you to my guided missile video. I think it's pretty good and it still holds up. And everything that applies to defending against guided missiles also applies to defending against uh, killer hacking alpha strikes. And now our final category in the top five archetypes of things that are good in Infinity and how to defend against them is impersonators and infiltrators plus. Everything I mentioned before about things like designated casualties and knowing that you're going to accept some losses and trying to control what those losses are, impersonators and infiltrators plus are very, very powerful pieces because they can bypass that. They can push into areas that you don't want and engage things that you did not want to engage and do things like, for example, have a Hassas in for day, kill your guided missile bot if you're playing nomads and unpick linchpin pieces. They can go after lieutenants. They can, there are, in any given list, there will often be pieces that you really don't want to get jumped on the first turn and infiltrators plus and impersonators can jump those things on the first turn. On top of that, they are often highly efficient attackers because they start at your deployment zone or in your deployment zone. It is often going to be one order to move into melee, fire a shotgun or make a CC attack. They are very efficient. Now they pay for that with cost. There are no really, really cheap impersonators. Often they'll be somewhere, they'll, they'll almost always be between 20 and 30 plus points, um, with some of them creeping up close to, in the most expensive cases, up to about 40. Uh, and that's like Shinobu Kitsune, who has not just infiltration plus six, but also hidden deployment. There are a lot of these in the game, and I'm here in the Nomad Army page with the most recently buffed one, Brand de Castro, uh, who has no wound in cap and shock immunity now. He is one of only a small number of impersonators plus, impersonators or infiltrators plus, that has effectively two wounds. The other most common one being Jan Star. They are good for very obvious, very obvious reasons. I'm not going to expand at great length on why they are good. This video is already already 54 minutes long and I'm running out of voice. 
anyone who's played against these understands how much of an absolute tick they can be to just hit your deployment zone and start trading and like take out the thing you didn't want to take it out. The most important thing with impersonators and infiltrators in terms of playing against them is to identify that they are coming. And this is going to be, to some extent, a degree of meta knowledge. You have to know what your opponent can have. That is, for newer players, going to mean dig through army, look at all of the profiles, uh, but then to an extent, just, just have the games where you're like, oh, what impersonation did you have in this army? I didn't know that Spiral Core had impersonation. I didn't know that, you know, etc. I didn't know that O12 had two models that could infiltrate on a plus three and fail both of their roles and end up with... Okay, O12 and person infiltrators plus are not particularly good. But, um, you know, you have, to, you, have to learn, you have to learn what exists and you have to develop that ability to look and kind of recognize that the potential exists for it to come because it is something that you can deal with most effectively at deployment. In particular, deciding what your reserve drop is going to be is usually going to be the most important decision you will make in dealing with impersonators and infiltrators plus. So for example, if you identify that a Speculo or a Hassassin for day is coming, you want to either, one, reserve drop the piece that they will try and kill. That might be your Interventor Lieutenant if you have one of those. It might be your Missile Bot if you have one of those. It might be Zoe, for example, but as a Hacker's Lamb player, I will usually try and kill the Missile Bot because killing the Missile Bot does a lot more than killing Zoe. Um, and reserve drop that piece. You, that, that just might be what you do. Reserve drop that piece. Uh, the other option, like if you just keep it away, if you just keep it a long way away from the impersonator, then the uh, attack efficiency of the impersonator disappears. Uh, the other thing that you can do is have, have an anti-impersonator deployment. That is usually something that can, if you can, it's something with like peripherals or mine layer. Mine layer is less efficient against something like Impersonators Plus, like Branda Castro, but still fine, where you can pin them in or threaten them immediately on their activation to to basically to present something that defends, maybe something that is a designated casualty, and a Libertos is per perfect for this. If your opponent is a Hacker's Lump player and you're like, yeah, there's a, there's always a Fide, there's always a Fide, the Fide is coming, you reserve drop your Libertos so that as soon as the Fide deploys, the Libertos just deploys right next to it. And maybe the Fide gets their kill, but they die doing it, damage is triaged, you get it. Uh, if you have a piece like Fiddler, I've used her as, as an impersonator counter drop in the past. She's not going anywhere near the impersonator, but two jackpots are. Another example, if you're playing Nomads, uh, all in one, Puppet Master with Puppet Bots. A Puppet Master is a hugely vulnerable individual piece. It's a single wound dude, and if they die, the Puppet Bots turn off. For days, we'll be going for the Puppet Master. But if you reserve drop the Puppet Master, you can use the puppets to cordon off in enemy impersonators while the Puppet Master is deployed as safely as possible. If I'm running a list with both an Interventor Lieutenant and Puppet Masters, I will actually probably consider reserving the Puppet Master and accepting that a Fide might kill the Interventor. That is a genuine consideration because the overall cost is probably higher if the Fide gets to decapitate the Puppet Master and then like re-impersonate. So have... Every list will almost always have something, even if it's just like a random Varangian guard, a random mine layer, or just your tag with a heavy flamethrower. There will be something that can be your reserve drop if you identify that the infiltrator is coming and you can and you have your piece that can counter deploy. The other thing that I cannot emphasize enough in terms of deploying against impersonators and infiltrators plus is please, for the love of God, do not set your army up as shotgun bait. I have been watching pictures from a tournament today that was happening in Sydney, and I almost had conniptions because, well, the deployment zones were set up like absolute trash, but on top of that, players were doing things like lining three troops up against a low wall. That is a really, really fast way to incredibly efficiently make an Impersonator or Infiltrator Plus take out not just more points than they were spent making the attack, but enough of your order pool in one order to potentially put you on the back foot for the entire game. If Branda Castro hops a wall and puts a shotgun into, you know, three Dakini tack bots or three Fusiliers and kills all of them, even if he dies doing it, you are down three orders on your first turn, three on your second, three on your third. And it costs your opponent 
if Brenda Castro dies, it costs your opponent four orders to do that, right? Because three orders to do that. One that Brand generated and spent, and then the two that Brand would generate on turn two and three. You have less resources for the entire game. So just do not stack, stack, layer, spread your deployments, whatever it is that you have to do so that a shotgun can't hit two things or three things or four things with the same blast. This will, by the way, also, like, keep you safe from things like Dalami, Coom Riders, and Libertos. It is a general skill that you should develop is spreading your deployment so that templates don't hit multiple models. Sometimes this is actually something that you can just practice. If you're like, oh, I think I get what he means, but that's really difficult to do. Um, just set up a table, set up a deployment, attack it with a Tiger creature. Reset and keep doing that until you get an idea for how to split your deployments up. If you find that it is impossible to split your best efforts, that is a table problem, and tell your tournament organizers to not make bad tables. A table should have nooks, crannies, scatter, places to hide behind, things that break line of fire even in a deployment zone. If you, if you find yourself confronted with a deployment zone that is comprised of three and a half rectangles all facing the same direction so you have nowhere to hide but behind the rectangles you've been handed a shit table that happens in events sometimes but tell your to give them feedback say hey this table is really bad there was nowhere for me to split my deployment up and brander castro came over a wall and killed my link team you can tell your tos and if they're good tos they'll take that on board you can learn how to make those tables yourself set them up in a way that does not make things terrible in extremis, you can also, if you and your opponent agree, you can muck around with tables before the game begins. Um, you know, don't, except in extremis. But if you have a good idea of what a table should look like, and no one has rolled for deployment, and no one has picked table sides, and you, you are having the chat that you should have with your opponent about how to play the table. How will we treat these doorways? How will we treat these stairs? How will we treat these windows? By the way, do you think these deployment zones are all right? It's fine to ask that question, and if you say no, and your opponent says no, then just call a TO and say like, hey, hey boss, um, I'm a bit worried about this table, these deployment zones look super, super hard to defend, no one's rolled to set up yet, do we have any more terrain, Do we can we like adjust things here a little bit? And a good TO will say, you're doing my job for me, fantastic, yes, here's a bunch of scatter that I have spare, or whatever, right? There's, TOs want events to be good and they want tables to be good, and especially if you and your opponent agree and you haven't rolled for rolled dice or anything, Nothing says you have to play on a shit table. Call the TO, have a chat, fix the table, play your game. I have done that in the past, and it has produced a better experience and frequently memorable games. Ideally, it doesn't come to that. Ideally, you have a table with a deployment zone that you can spread your deployment, have your counter deployment, not get got by one shotgun, but it's worth just remembering it as a possibility. Anyway, that wraps up my top five troop archetypes in Infinity and how to defend against them. As a reminder, it is cheap, irregular attackers and defenders, main battle warbands, main battle tags, all kinds of hacking attacks and impersonators and advanced infiltrators. That covers a lot of the game. Uh, if you've looked at this list and gone, everyone has those. Yeah, they do. So does your faction. You should use them. They're really good. It's good to use things that are good, but it's very important to know what makes them good and how to defend against them. I hope you found this useful. Please leave comments if you did. If you've enjoyed this and other types of videos that you would like to see, it is hard to make these because I have just spoken for just over an hour in one take and one cut, and that's not easy to do, but I had a good time doing it and I hope you enjoyed this. Leave a comment, like and subscribe. I don't say that often, but please do that. It is nice to see that. It's nice to get the feedback and let me know what else you'd like to see in future. Bye.